This week's show is sponsored by Whimsies by Wellness. We're all attached to our dogs, but according to science, some of us form attachments with our dogs that are equivalent to bonds with parents, siblings and even partners. Think of your own dog. How does your relationship with them rank in the four features of attachment? One, they should be a dependable, secure base. Two, they're the ones you go to when you feel upset. Three, you enjoy their presence. And four, you miss them when they're not there. We know that people experience these with other people, but how attached are we to our dogs? What's the difference between a mother looking at her child and her dog? And perhaps more intriguingly, are our dogs really attached to us? Perhaps we should put them in a brain scanner to find out. Welcome to the Dog Scholar. How, how attached do you use to your dogs? I know you, I know the answer to you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you really need to no, ask? No, yeah. We are very, very, we are very attached to my dog. As dogs, you know, as dogs, I, I, I love to spend time with them. I'm not a, a dictator in the living room or anything else like that. You know, it's not dogs off furniture, dogs off such and such. Don't mind as long as you're invited. Do it as long as you're told to come off. Do it, whatever it happens to be. But I spend a lot of time just being. I think you can get more attached to some dogs than others as yeah, well. well. That yeah, might be well. controversial. Like, you know, I know you're no, not no, supposed to have true. like a favourite child. I'm definitely, definitely more attached to Luther than the other two. I love them. I love them all infinitely, but I'm super close to Luther. D dare I say I want to go a bit deep on this? Go on then. Right. I'm obviously really attached to my dogs. I do it for a living. My dogs are my life. But I have to be honest, since, since I lost my one dog, as we say, you can be more attached to one mm. dog. I really went on a journey of why did this end me so much? Because, you know, I'm, I've got no shame in saying I was absolutely devastated for nearly two years when I lost Brody. I still I can't hey, talk, I get choked Aww. up when I talk about it because it really bothers me still. And it made me think, wh why? I've never, I never don't grieve like that. I've lost, you know, um, grandparents and family members and I'm quite well put together. It, it doesn't bother me in, in that way. But losing that dog was, honest to God, it broke my heart. And I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole thinking, why is that? And, and I thought when we're looking at these um, these four features of attachment, it's understandable that you enjoy their presence. It's understandable that you miss them when they're not there. I think the problem occurs when they're your dependable, your, your their dependable, secure base. And when you go to them when you're upset, as soon as they're gone out of your life, then there's a massive void there. And what, what I've done now, thinking about it, like, again, I spend all my time with dogs, I do all my thing, but I've made a concerted effort not to go down that rabbit hole because, honest to God, I cannot go through that again. I literally can't. You know, we're on five years now and I still get choked up talking about it. So that was my thing. I try to keep now the dependable, secure base and the ones you go to when you're upset. I, I try and make that more about people than me dogs. And I know you can lose people, but... Unfortunately, dogs don't live nowhere near as long as people. Yeah, but I see it with my clients as well. The problems that, that that they're struggling with with their dogs, a lot of it is through an unhealthy attachment and, and they're, they're flooding their dogs with, with, with their emotions. You know what I mean? So, to what extent do people see their dogs as attachment figures compared to other relationships? Well, a study looked at that and they asked 1,000 people questions about their relationships with their dogs, their relationships with other people, their dog's personality and their own personality. And that let the researchers make an assessment of how close they were and what mattered to them most about their attachment to their dogs. They found people got the same level of comfort from being physically close to their dogs as they did from their fathers and siblings, but not quite as much as they got comfort from being close to their mother's friends and partners. But the strongest features of attachment for them with dogs was enjoying their company and missing them. Believe it or not, 22% of people place their dogs in the top two closest attachments. But for those who are generally very attached to their dogs, the closeness that they felt with their dogs was equivalent to mothers and siblings and besties and partners. But here's the one. It was even higher than they felt for their own fathers. <laughs> Sorry, dads. Do you, are you surprised that so many people put their dogs in their top two attachments? No. I, I, no, I'm not. But but I would, uh, I think there's only one... only a quarter. I, I think there's one thing saying it. I think it's very easy to say it and to say that's what I feel about my dog and such and such. But I think when push came to shove, if you've got this roadside conundrum mm -hmm. of your child's about to step out or your dog's about to step out, which one do you jump in front of and save? Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people that would even put on, on a parallel would probably choose. Uh, and they would prefer that another human would choose to save 
the yeah, human yeah. As, a, as opposed to the dog. So, but it doesn't surprise me that people want to feel this attachment. That, that, that there's a that they have this emotional attachment to dogs. You know, I'm I'm like Danny. I've been through multiple losses of dogs that are, and I think probably just by nature, trauma develops resilience as a defense mechanism to prevent me from you know experiencing it again. So that has probably led to my more you know, sort of like held back, sort of like you have this amount of time, I'll enjoy this amount of time that I have with you. The inevitable is inevitable. And, you know, and that's my sort of thinking as well. But I totally get people where they pour everything into their dog, you know, whether it's that they're alone or that they're in some kind of, you know, emotional situation that's causing them difficulty and they want to invest everything into their dog. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Completely and utterly understand it, completely natural. I have been on, like you, on, on the bitter end and... Don't want to go there again, Absolutely. you know. So as a defence, yeah. I, I pull back a little. I can. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time telling you know, trying to educate that do dogs aren't children, and if you respect your dog as a dog, you're going to get more out of it. But that being said, you know the findings of ha that we're seeing that we feel the same sort of attachments as children. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest, and I wouldn't say that's taboo. If you're when you think of it, it, it is like having having a child in that aspect. You're you're responsible for their well being. Mm. They you know you know growing up and watching them grow into adults and guiding them in what's right and wrong. A lot of it ties over. And I think if, if you hold that sort of responsibility, that naturally will evolve into that sort of attachment. It doesn't surprise me, that, that study. We, we, it's a standing joke in my house, though, yeah. that I like the dog more than Mike. Yeah. <laughs> but that point that you were making about mothers and their mm. children is a really relevant one. I found a study on this. So they scanned the brains of 14 mothers to measure their brain activation as they were looking at pictures of their child and their own dog. Now, as a control in this study, they also scanned their brains when they were looking at pictures of someone else's child that they didn't know, um, and also a dog that they didn't know. And they found similar brain activity when they were looking at images of their child and their dog. It was activating the same parts of the brain. And they saw more positive emotional responses for their own child and dog than the unfamiliar child and dog. And the brain network that was involved in reward and emotion and bonding was active when they were looking at both their child and their dog. Both of those are involving the part of the brain that signals that something's important and that's what makes us focus on it. So in this case, it's like the needs of the child or like you were saying, the needs yeah, of the dog. Yeah, I can't believe I, call, I literally called that word for word. You I, I, absolutely to God, did. I should just be a scientist. I should be. <laughs> now, there were some differences, mind you. So the brain area for affiliation lit up more for their child than their dog. But the more attached they were to their dog, the more pleasantness was activated in the brain as well. It's because the child's a little the dog doesn't do as it's told, but it gets excused. That the child gets bollocked. That's true. That's true. <laughs> dog what, doesn't answer back. Yeah. yeah. What they found was that mothers certainly have similar patterns of brain activity of emotion for both their child and their dog, but there were some differences which would reflect the very different evolutionary underpinnings of both of those relationships. So why do they have these strong emotional ties? That's the question. Why? I think there's a role thing in this. So like you were saying earlier on mm. about it's your job to look after It's the, the natural dog. kind of evolution yeah. of doing a particular set of tasks for it so is. long and then it's yeah. the same outcome. And I also think the way that dogs have evolved, uh, now bearing in mind they had to live amongst social groups, I think that we've gone to the dogs that have got, you know, baby-like eyes, big eyes like babies. When you compare a dog's eyes to wolves, yeah. they're, they're very different, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So I think that that kind of attracts us to it. You go to dogs that look cute and you go, ah, oh, like that. So those dogs become more selectively bred and those traits are bred into the dogs. And the submissive tendencies of the dogs as well. So I think actually we've gone to dogs that will trigger that kind of response from us more and bred those traits in. Mm. I think that's, yeah, that's sort of like neotenization, I think, isn't it? Is, yeah. is a terminology where you see like a chimpanzee with it with its cute little eyes or a chipmunk yeah. or something with these mammalian features that are accentuated to look like a young child that yeah. trigger, you know, involuntarily, like you say, that, that within you. I, I think it's important. I think it's important that you trigger some kind of emotional, uh, uh, yeah. isn't it? I think as that, well, when you, I, th I think as well in this day and age, everything's so fast paced and a lot of the time emotional needs maybe aren't being met with people and we can we can look for that in other species dogs in particular like a lot of people me with or um, me and lou with our kids they had pets that you generally start off with maybe fish or sorry fish or uh, the 
Not, not the longest. I'm not sure the, he won't be offended. Not the longest. I think one of them survived yeah. for ages. His name was Gay Lord, uh, who was Leo. It was a little Aww. picture of him with a plaque in the garden. But um, fish and um, degus, hamsters, gerbils, this, that, and the other. And a lot of people say it teaches the child the value of responsibility and mm -hmm. to and to have to care, you know, for another. When they get it right. For an, when they get it. <laughs> And, and inevitably, as parents of kids of who've had sort of like, yeah. you know, a young mammal rodents, whatever, uh, uh, you know, we'll find that they don't always get it right and fish. Um, but it's part of developing that nurturing. Um, it makes you wonder. No, I don't, I've never thought about this, but this has just made me think about this, whether that is a rehearsal for parenthood. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The care of that. So so that that is why perhaps we're seeing a similar sort of like activity within the brain when you are looking at an infant in comparison to what you would, you know, attribute as being your preparation for mm. that infant in, in parents. I don't know, you know, just to sort I, of like I've got, out there. I've got a funny fish story if you want one. Oh, yeah. Give um, us a my, fish I, story. When my, my, daughter, my daughter, Ebony, she's um, she's 19 now. She's in university. But when she was um, when she was a baby, we got her a fish and she called it fish. Oh. There's a fish called fish. <laughs> And all was well and good until we ordered the chippy meal. And I walked in and went, <gasps> and she had a handful of chips in the fish tank. And she went, Dad, look, fish and chips. <laughs> <laughs> fish dad. Yeah. So bearing in mind, we are talking about the way that mothers will look at their dog and see the same thing as their child. It, can that impact on the welfare of the dog if you're treating your dog like a child? If you over amplify something, then yeah, absolutely. If it's within reason, yeah. do you know what I mean? Then uh, uh, it, it's the extremes, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Too much. It's not a child, you know, which we, we know that. If you want to invest all your emotion into it, fine, but also acknowledge the fact they're dogs yeah. with dog needs. Um, and on the other end of it, I have no emotional attachment. What's what's what? Well, don't get one then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, uh, get, 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 absolutely. Get get a pair of roller skates. We need or a happy medium. Like that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And as such is is everything within life, isn't it? It's it's the middle ground that is generally slightly either side or perhaps as you vary your way along the way. But ultimately, yes, yes, give them the, the have uh, you know project emotion onto them. Just don't project the image of being something other than what you actually yeah. are. I think we're ready them. for a, a Wellesy comes. powerful example. I don't think there's anything wrong with treating your dog like a child when it comes to like welfare, making sure that they're well, they're not sick, they're fed, they're watered, they're loved, that kind of thing. That's not a problem. I think the problem comes when we start, when that is at the cost of disrespecting them as a species. So for example, if I was to say to the viewers at home, you know, I've got a, a newborn baby there and I'm going to put him in the garden for a in the pissing down rain and then he's going to have his dinner off the floor everyone would be mortified phoning social services so my point being if it's such an atrocity to treat a baby like a dog why is it so acceptable to treat a dog like a baby because mm. in accordance to how that species thinks and feels it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't pan out like that mm. you know what I mean which is why we see such alarming statistics with dog bites and, and fallout of yeah. behavioural um, issues with dogs this week's show is sponsored by Whimsies by Wellness a good dental chew should be a win-win. Your dog gets a treat they can take off to a corner and chew on, and you get a significant improvement in their breath and all-round oral health. The Whimsies Alligator and Toothbrush Chews have been designed with unique shapes to help clean the smaller spaces between dog's teeth and ensure proper blood flow through the gums, all while your dog chews. Look out for Whimsies at pet stores or order online by clicking the link in the description. What attachment-like brain activity do dogs experience when they see their human's face? Well, we found a study that looked at exactly that. They presented dogs with videos of their owner and a familiar person that wasn't their owner and a stranger. And all of these people had either happy or angry faces. And they recorded brain scans and eye tracking and the behaviours of the dogs while they were looking at these two things. They found that the stranger activated more brain regions that are involved in the visual and motor processing. Now it could be because of curiosity or fear, like the dogs are getting ready to move closer because they're curious or to run away because they're afraid. The familiar person had quite weak brain activations overall. The dogs are just a bit like, meh, whatever. Um, but their owner, this was really special, that triggered more activation in the area involved in the mother-infant attachment behavior. In mice, rats and monkeys, if that part of the brain is damaged, then maternal behavior is impaired. Now with all of the emotions, both the happy and angry faces, the videos of their owner activated brain regions associated with emotion and attachment in humans. 
And what they saw was that dogs were always pleased to see their human, whether they were happy or not. So there's definite attachment-like neural responses in dogs when they saw the face of their owner. So dogs are attached to us, just like we are to I'm, them. I'm sorry, I'm thinking, uh, your dogs don't think like you do. When you put your dog in a crate, he's not going, you've put me in a crate. But when you come to let them out, they go, oh, you're, and, they get, and you're constantly rehearsing them, being excited to see you because it betters their situation. They think differently. It's true because the dogs were still pleased to see their owners, even if their owners were angry. They were yeah. still initially happy to see them. Yeah. But if you, if you see a dog as being frozen in time as being quite a juvenile version of the adult wolf or whatever, which is what we've intentionally done, then it, it's a pack animal. It's a social yeah. animal. They, they they live in groups like other social mammals. It makes sense, doesn't it? That, that a member of my, my group, my tribe, my pack, whatever you want to call it, has returned. It gives me a feeling of feel good, even if, again, obviously probably on a basic evolutionary sense, even if not because, oh no, they're in a bad mood, but the safety in numbers and my yeah. group has come back so yeah. I feel better about it, probably wouldn't see the same thing in like a, a, a solitary living animal. You know, yeah. uh, it'd be interesting to see what would happen now, wouldn't it? You know, how they, they would see. Absolutely, yeah. How can you build the bond with your dog? You start off exactly as you mean to go on. You start off by teaching your dog, raising your dog, interacting with your dog as being somebody who is of the utmost importance, the utmost significance to be able to develop that relationship, that mutualism, that the dog sees you as the bringer of things that are of value, as the person that warns them of things that perhaps aren't of value, so that your words become important, your information that you give becomes important. Absolutely people can do it. Everybody should do it. It's more important than basic yes or no, obedience commands, etc. Oh. It's more important than problem solving with dogs. The more you have that relationship, the more that you develop it, the more that you increase that, that sort of like um, feel-good factor when the two of you together at either end oh. of the lead, yeah. then the greater your probability of having a very I've, successful I've relationship. Have you had a dog that you couldn't bond with? Have you ever had a dog you don't Somebody like? Somebody else's dogs. <laughs> Yeah. There have yeah. been other people's dogs, that, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. it ties into the sort of like non-familiar person. Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. dogs are individuals. You know, chances are when you don't bond with a dog, that dog's probably a bit more aloof in character and just not really interested in interaction. And a big problem that I see with, with, working with, with, with the public is sometimes when they get that dog, they have an unrealistic expectation of what they want from that dog. And I have to be the bringer of news of, you know, you're going to have issues by trying to force that with this dog. This dog just likes to be what it was. The biggest example of that would be like, I just want him to play with dogs and your dog's like, I, I just doesn't like other dogs. It just wants to be on its own. You know, leave, let, leave the dog be. That's fine. Stop forcing the dog mm. to have these these interactions. I wonder if there are any dogs that look at people and they're like, oh, mm. I just don't like you. Mm. <laughs> you know, like sometimes you meet a person, you don't yeah. like the look of them. I wonder if dogs do that. Do you know what? No finer example exists of that than walking down the corridor of that, a rehoming centre, yeah. if you like, and thinking, which one appeals to me? Do you know what I mean? So you, there are a lot of dogs that a person would think, no, for whatever reason, even before you read the write-up, there's no, that dog doesn't, that dog, you do. Yeah. And I wonder if the dogs sit on the other side of the glass thinking, Don't pick she's me. nice, she's nice. <laughs> yeah. On your way, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be funny. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. They, look, they look like a mug. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what car did you pull up in? Yeah. Some, some people choose a dog based on aesthetics because they like yeah. the look of it. I wonder if some dogs are like, no, she's a brunette. Absolutely <laughs> not. I know. For <laughs> Just go, go on, going back to how to build that sort of attachment from your dog. I think the most basic way you can start everything that Jamie explained is just be, be in the moment with your dog. If you're going to do things with your dog... Don't be thinking about, oh, well, I've got to go out next week and I've got to get back to this uh, this email and what have you. There's a great meme out there and it says, why are dogs happier than people? And it's a picture of, there's, there's two of them. There's a fella and, a, and, and one with a woman and they're sat on a bench with a dog next to them and there's a speech bubble from their mind and the person's going like, holidays, cash, mortgages, everything. And the dog's just got a picture of the two of them on the bench. Aww. And that to me re represents what dogs are. And, and I think the easiest way to start that journey is give your dog time. If you want your dog to feel the same sort of attachment, make the effort to be in the moment with your dog. Don't yeah. just go through the motions. Be in the moment with your dog. I love that. I love this topic. Yeah. What are people asked about us, Jay? Okay, question one. We've got Errol from Knob End. Of course you are, Errol. Yeah, of yeah. course you are. Where else would you live? We'll decide Errol. whether you are after this question. Let's see. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it is a place. It's in South Lancashire. Uh, you've read my card. <laughs> <laughs> it is a place in South Lancashire, and it's Errol from Knob End in South Lancashire. Is tail wagging a reliable indicator for humans on their dog's state? You're always taught that dogs wagging their tail means that they're happy, but I think you mentioned in another show that it isn't true. Do they have control of their tails? I'd hope so. Like we can fake smiling. Oh, that's Ooh, a good deception. One. Yeah, yeah. deceptive little tail wagger, well, you, you Errol. You get a little sneaky yeah, one. You doubt it. Goes, up. I'm going to make him look like he mm. wants to. I've got a story about that as well. <laughs> um, to answer the question, no one particular trait in a dog should be read solely. You know, no, no visual cues, no, no, no ears, no, no, no eyes, no tail. It, you need to read body language as a whole. And many, many dogs will wag the tail for bad intentions, not just for being flagging. Happy. Yeah, what you call yeah, flagging. Yeah, 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 flagging. Yeah, yeah. The wag that most people will get confused is an, a, a wag of arousal, mm. which can displace into something that's unpleasant. And then the kind of soft wag. And then, and then there's three wags, isn't there? And mm. then there's the really excitable rag, mm. um, wag, rag, wag. <laughs> the main one is that rattlesnake one, you know, that that, that real like mm. pinpoint of arousal. I think that and yawning are probably the most misunderstood things when you when when, when, when people yeah. read the dog. They'll see their dog going up to another dog and they'll be wagging their tail, but it is no. the rat, the rattlesnake wag, and they think, oh, it's all yeah. right, they just want to play. And you're kind of looking at the dog, thinking, I don't think they do want to play, yeah. not in the way that you're hoping. I Recorded this clip, so Truman's out on the beach, he's bombing along, uh, running towards another dog, shouting to wait, and he lays down. N next to Truman, just behind Truman, is a dog that is stood stock still, older dog than Truman, and the tail is yeah. up like a sickle, but ever so slightly going like this. Now, a lot of people might look at that and think, oh, his tail's wagging. Whereas I talk through this video saying, look at the behaviour of the dog. That's concerning to me. And rightly so, when I broke Truman and Truman went away, which I don't think shows in later on in the video, um, as he came past back, the dog went... <sighs> Yeah. Like that, as he passed. Now, that was a fearful dog because it was yeah. a grimace. It, it wasn't yeah. anything behind it. But people might look at that and think, his tail's wagging. Look how happy he is that Truman's laying down in front of him. Whereas the reality is that dog would be thinking, one more move towards me, my son. Do you know what I mean? One move in my yeah. direction. I'm not comfortable. You're having it. Yeah. You know, and that, it, that tail wag is always accompanied with a real stance. Yeah, stance. exactly. And that in, in, in all animals is a display of, look how big I am. You don't want any of this. It's trying to deter... Do you, do you know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. So we've, I've got a dog, um, well, I had a dog, Eli, he's one of my trainer's dogs now, um, Lewis, and he has never, ever, ever had an issue with dogs. He's never had a squabble with dogs. He's never done anything. But just by nature, he is so assertive. As soon as you let him off with the other dogs, he does his thing. And if they come anywhere near him, that same posture comes, tail up, wagon, like really big. And then they go, And but my dogs know how to interact with dogs because I made an effort to teach them. So they see that and they go on and they, and they go about the business. And then Eli goes about his business. Don't let people light here and say everything can be resolved with training because you can't change character in Absolutely. a dog. You can change behaviour. You'll never make him stop feeling like that, but you can teach him to make the right choices. Yeah. So me and Lewis always say, that dog in a pet home would be a nightmare because they just assume because he hasn't had them, them sort of like, you know, interactions that have led to a fight that he wouldn't. But you can see it in the dog. You can see it there in him. So you need to, you know, observe it and pay so attention. So to sum up on that one, you could imagine the wag to be a bit like a smile. Some smiles yeah. are happy smiles. Other smiles might be a sarcastic smile. So it yeah. completely depends on the context and what's accompanying it. Great question, Errol. Thank yeah, you. Question. Second question. Thank you. Second question comes from Linda at Nork Rise in Surrey. Hello, Dog Scholar team. My son is 14 and he's very attached to our dog. Dog. I worry sometimes that he doesn't seem to socialise much with other people. He never seems to talk about friends at school, and I just wanted to ask if you think it should be a problem, or I should consider it a problem. Do some people just prefer the company of animals? I think this is a great question, Linda, actually. And my determination on this is whether or not it gets in the way of normal life for him. Is it impacting his ability to operate and function normally. And if it isn't, then I wouldn't say that it's a problem. Mm. I know as a parent, it can be worrying if you look at your child and they're not doing what you would expect them to do, but I don't always think that it's problematic. For me, when I was a child, I much preferred the company of animals. I didn't bother much with people. So um, I might be being completely biased because of my own experience, but I wouldn't see it as a problem unless it's actually yeah, going in the way of life. Unless you, it, well, if you see it as a problem, it, 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 I suppose it's a problem. You know, if, if, if that interaction is now having a knock-on effect that, that, that you, you know, you, is it a son, yeah? Son? Yeah. You, you, your son is no longer 
able to really communicate with people and it's str he's struggling socially, then it is a problem. I remember when um, when I got my um, ADHD diagnosis, no shock to anyone there, I was going around the world at the same time, going through ear, nose and throat because I kept thinking it was a problem with my throat. And um, apparently um, traits of Tourette syndrome can be can be linked with it. And he said, it's a tick every now and again. <clears throat> it's not, there's nothing in me throat. I'm ticking. Leo used to so do I that. went in a panic mode. I thought, oh my God, what if I'm going to wake up one morning and be swearing all the time? And I'd have thought, me, I do anyway. <laughs> um, but then what the doctor said to me was, it's like um, OCD or anything. Loads of people have traits of things, but whether it's a problem depends on how it, in, if it negatively impacts your life. And if mm. it's not, don't worry about it. Yeah. So. If it was my lad, Linda, I'd speak to my son, yeah. you know, as well. I'd, I'd just set some, no doubt you do, yeah. you know, I'd but got, I'd just set yeah. some time aside to speak to my son and just talk. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Just, and just see, because maybe there is something that I find far easier to communicate or not communicate yeah. in the presence of an animal than I do in other people. But in the meantime, it might be worth building on that. So maybe see if there's a, um, a dog club that, Yep. you can go to maybe dog agility or something like that or some form of dog sport yep. if it's something that he's really interested in with my my business unleashed we we've got like with the all the clients coined it themselves unleashed family and if you get your 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 son into some dog training and go into classes you, he'll he'll meet like-minded people yeah. and, and in turn you can actually use the dog as a gateway to get more social interactions with people what a, what a, what a great point see you next week